speaker today is the Secretary of Socialist Party Scotland, uh, Phil Scott. Thanks, Cathy. Um, in the interest of energy and concentration, I'll try and keep my remarks to about 35 minutes. But I think that the discussion we're having today is not just about Scotland. It's an international uh, question that we're debating and discussing. Because the impact of the capitalist crisis across the world has had many effects. We've seen the re-emergence of the working class as a mass force. The question of the general strike on the agenda in a whole series of countries, including in Britain. We've also seen the emergence of new formations of the working class, for example, Syriza in Greece and a number of other countries as well. But one of the other features, and I think this is the, the point we need to discuss today, in relation to the crisis, is the sharpening and the emergence of national and regional conflicts around the national question, particularly in Europe, and as it affects a series of countries. We saw in September, one and a half million people marched in Barcelona in relation to demands for Catalan independence or more autonomy. We've seen the rise of Flemish nationalism, and the NVA in the recent elections, the new Flemish alliance, who formally on paper stand for the separation of Flanders <coughs> from Belgium. We have the ongoing situation in Scotland with now a, a referendum on Scottish independence now set in, in late 2014. And we have the ongoing situation, as we know, in Northern Ireland <coughs> in terms of the sectarian division there as well. Now, these long-standing national conflicts have been sharpened and have been aggravated by the economic crisis, by the policy of austerity and of cuts that capitalist governments are implementing across the world. And one of the points that we would make is that if capitalism could not resolve the national question in a period of relative growth or of economic growth, what chance is there that the national question can be resolved in the basis of economic depression, of slump conditions, of savage cuts and austerity facing the vast majority of the working class internationally? And it's under these conditions that demands and the movements around the national question for autonomy, in some cases for independence, can pose the question of a revolutionary character. It can be of a right-wing character, it can be of a left-wing character, and it can raise a whole number of challenges for the Marxist movement, for the socialist movement internationally about how it engages in these struggles and in these movements in the next period. Because ultimately, for the working class, for the oppressed, for the poor, the national question, in the words of Lenin, is a question of bread, in other words, of survival. For many sections of the working class, internationally, and this will be a feature in Scotland in 2014, the issue of independence is going to be linked, at least in the minds of a layer of the youth and the working class, to an escape route from austerity and cuts. Now, we have to, of course, have a balanced approach towards that. In Scotland, since the Act of Union in 1707, there has been a national question in the modern sense in Scotland. It's waxed and waned. National consciousness was at quite a low ebb for a whole historical period, particularly linked to the rise of the British Empire and British imperialism. But there is no question that post the Second World War, the demise of industrial production, and particularly in Scotland, who is a key hub in terms of industrial production for British capitalism, that the decline of those industries, that the experience of Thatcherism, the experience of the poll tax, and the demise, if you like, of the Tories as a political electoral force in Scotland as well, has all led and contributed to rising demands for the autonomy, for a Scottish Parliament, and also for independence as well. Just to give one figure, in 1979, support for Scottish independence was 7% of the population. Currently, support for independence in Scotland is between 30 and 40 per cent. There was a poll taken by Ipsos Mori in January of this year, just after Cameron made his crass intervention in relation to the referendum on Scottish independence. That poll showed 39 per cent of Scots in favour of independence from the UK. But amongst those from, quote, deprived backgrounds, Support for independence wasn't 39%, it was 58%. And for those among, and who live in affluent backgrounds, 
then support for independence was only 27%. And what this underlines is one of the points that the Socialist Party has made for a number of years and the militant before that, is that for a layer of the working class of the youth in Scotland, the national question, and particularly the question of independence, is linked to seeking a way out of the economic crisis of austerity, of cuts, and for a future. And with the, this uh, referendum in 2014, is going to be conducted against the background of plummeting living standards, of savage cuts on austerity, <coughs> and it's inevitable in the, the run-up to 2014 that the question and that issue will be debated and discussed at, at, at length. And it's not just a question of Scotland. Look at the impact this referendum will have in Northern Ireland. Because already the sectarian parties on both sides are lining up pro and anti the Union in, in terms of <coughs> preparing for the referendum itself. What about the impact on Wales? And commies can come in on that in relation to a possible yes vote for Scottish independence and how that can drive further demands for more powers to the Welsh Assembly as well uh, as a result of that. And what of the impact in England also in relation to the possibility of the breakup of the UK and the separation and creation of an independent Scottish state itself? And in that sense, a majority vote for an independent Scotland is a nightmare scenario for the British ruling class, which is why they are prepared to throw the kitchen sink at the campaign in order to try to defend their class interests and the interests of British capitalism itself. David Cameron, in a speech a couple of weeks ago, made the point that he wants to dedicate his premiership, or what's left of it, on the campaign to defeat Scottish independence. And it's reflected in the economic interests of British capitalism, whether that's the issue in relation to the loss of North Sea oil revenue, question of the renewables in Scotland, the issue of pride, all of these issues will come up in terms of the debate in relation to Scottish independence. But for the Socialist Party and for Marxists, we advocate and defend the right of nations to self-determination. That is the right up to and including the right to form an independent state. But we don't always advocate support for independence. One of the points we made in relation to 1979, <coughs> the referendum for the set up of a Scottish Parliament or a Scottish Assembly as it was at that time in 79, the support for independence was only 7%. When the militant campaigned in favour of a yes vote for the set up of a Scottish Parliament in 1979, the slogan and the demands we raised were for a socialist Britain with for autonomy for Scotland. Now that slogan today is completely outmoded and redundant in relation to big sections of the working class in Scotland. It's no longer sufficient to raise the demand or the slogan of a socialist Britain. Because of the way consciousness and demands around the creation of a Scottish Parliament, of autonomy, of a layer of the working class looking to independence as a way out of the crisis relates to that. And the slogan that we will intervene in the referendum in 2014 is the demand for an independent socialist Scotland linked to a socialist confederation with England, Wales, and Ireland as a step to a socialist Europe. Why do we raise it and oppose it in that way? It's because of the way in which consciousness has developed and changed over the years in relation to the national question. Now, Marxism has a long and I think noble tradition and history in how it's dealt with the national question. In the neo-colonial world, because of the role of imperialism, the question of the, of the right to form independent states free from occupation has obviously been on the banner of Marxism for years and even for centuries. Karl Marx, for example, raised the issue of independence for, for Ireland in relation to British imperialism. Leon Trotsky raised the demand of the removal of Spanish influence in relation to Morocco. We've of course had the battle in terms of uh, um, Algerian independence from, uh, from France itself and obviously the experience of Vietnam, US and French imperialism as, uh, uh, as well. But in the advanced capitalist countries, where the question of colonial oppression is not posed in the way, of course, that it is in the neo-colonial world, then it, it, it doesn't mean that the national question doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that consciousness in relation to demands for autonomy and for independence are not posed in this period. In fact, the potential breakup of nation states under the conditions of economic depression and of unprecedented economic crisis can be posed in a number of countries. And that is under those conditions 
marchers have to intervene in those movements and put forward a position. And demands that we raised 25 years ago, or 30 years ago, cannot necessarily apply to the current situation. And what we need to take from Lenin and from the programme of Marxism and the national question is a method. It's a method of approach and analysis that has to be skillfully applied that can help unlock the complexities of the national question itself. What's our starting point? Our starting point is the unity of the working class. That's first and foremost on the banner, not, not just of the Socialist Party of Scotland, not just of the CWI, but of international socialism itself. That is, we stand for the unity of the working class at all levels within Scotland, the unity of the working class in relation to Scotland and England, the unity of the working class in relation to Britain and internationally also. We reject the argument, and it was raised yesterday at the rally, the idea of one nation. One nation Toryism has heard from the likes of the Israelis in the past, regurgitated, spewed up by Ed Miliband at the recent Labour Party conference. This idea that we're all in it together, that we're all Scottish, or we're all British, the idea promoted by bourgeois and petty bourgeois nationalism has got nothing in common with the approach of Marxism itself. However, where a strong national consciousness exists, where demands for democratic rights to form parliaments or even an independent state under certain circumstances is raised, we have no option but to take account of the outlook of broad layers of the working class to show that socialists oppose all uh, forms of oppression on the one hand, but also the demand for democratic rights where they're raised and where they're fought for in relation to the nation states as, as well. And from that point of view, on the banner of our programme for the last number of years has been the demands for a referendum in Scotland to test the opinion of the Scottish people in relation to their views and their relationship with the rest of the UK. It's raised in relation to Catalonia in the last period with the Rajoy government in Madrid refusing to allow a referendum to take place. And our Spanish colleagues also having to grapple with the question of demands around a referendum, not just with one question about independence from Catalonia, but a number of questions, a multi-option referendum. In actual fact, that's what we raise in our programme. Now in 2014, there is only one question on the ballot paper, for or against independence. But to be honest, that's a very, that complicates the situation a bit more in Scotland. Because there is a big section of the working class, probably at least a third, who, who don't support independence, but don't support the status quo either. They want a maximum form of devolution. That is a transfer of significant economic tax raising powers to the Scottish Parliament, but short of full independence. So this referendum will now take place against the backdrop of people being asked to choose for and against independence. And therefore already we're beginning to see a certain polarisation in the debate amongst layers of the working class in relation to how this referendum will go will, will before itself. Now I made the point earlier on that throughout the 1980s and 1990s, the support for devolution or for a Scottish Parliament grew significantly because of the experience of Thatcherism, the poll tax, the industrial decline of Scotland and so on. Thatcher refused to make any concessions on the national question in relation to the Scottish <coughs> Parliament. And that led in 1997 to a referendum in Scotland for the creation of a Scottish Parliament. And 70% of people backed the creation of, the, of, that, of that Parliament. And it's clear that the failures of the Scottish Parliament to deliver in relation to the working class and young people has spurred further, further demands for more powers or for independence. According to opinion polls just now, 65, perhaps even 70% of people in Scotland want a parliament with more power, either a fully independent parliament or a de devolution max, maximum devolution, enhanced devolution parliament in, in, in itself. And that's been driven by the experience of the inability of the Scottish parliament to make a decisive and fundamental difference in the lives of the, of the working class itself. And the referendum in 2014, and there's now been an agreement signed similar to the situation of Northern Ireland, every agreement is given the name of the town or the, or the city that signed it. But the Edinburgh Agreement was signed on the 15th of October between Salmond and Cameron, which now paves the way for a legal referendum on Scottish independence, has now raised the stakes even higher in relation 
to British, the, Brit the interests of the British ruling class. And it really is an issue of throwing the dice here. There's a little bit of a poker game taking place. Because on the one hand, the SNP would have preferred two questions. They wanted a question of independence, but they also wanted a safety net. But if independence is defeated, then maximum devolution is then delivered in relation to the referendum. And that would have been the likely outcome of, of, of the referendum in Scotland. But Cameron and all of the major pro-union parties, including the Labour Party, stood up, put their face against that. So now we have a one-question referendum in relation to 2014. So how would we intervene in that referendum? Now we will advocate support for a yes vote in the referendum. But it will be a very critical yes vote. And I want to try and explain the approach that we want to take. If the question is posed about the powers of independence and what they mean for the working class, then we have to raise in this referendum campaign that if Scotland's independent or has, has the powers over the economy, then first of all, for the nationalisation of gas and oil, for the renewable sector, for the renationalisation of gas and electricity, for a socialist planned economy based on democratic public ownership and their workers, workers' control. If the powers to the Scottish Parliament are given in relation to welfare, the minimum wage, in relation to the distribution of wealth and taxation, in relation to the abolition of the anti-trade union laws, for a massive investment of the nationalisation of the banks to release resources to invest in the public sector and the creation of jobs and so on as well. In contrast to that, the SNP, as we know, advocate an independent capitalist Scotland that would slash corporation tax. They wanted to use in the past the, the Celtic Tiger in Ireland and Iceland and Norway as models for an independent Scotland on, on a capitalist basis. Now the question can be posed, is it likely that Scotland will vote for independence in 2014? If the election was tomorrow or the referendum was tomorrow, it's very likely that independence would be defeated. Because only around a third, perhaps 35, perhaps 40% of the electorate would back the question of, of, of independence. But what happens in 2014 is a lot of an unknown factor here. It's two years down the road. It's two further years of savage austerity, of cuts and of fallen living standards. And if a layer of the working class believe this is our only way out from a continuation of an onslaught by the capitalist class, by big business, by the interests of the rich and the powerful against us, and the only way out is to go for independence, it's undoubtedly the case that a layer will move in that direction. The question is how many move in that direction. And there are a couple of points that can be made about that. Crucially, what is the role of the SNP leadership in relation to this debate and discussion? The SNP have succeeded in the last number of years in Scotland in replacing Labour as the major political party in the country. In their recent elections in 2011, the SNP swept the board, won a majority in the Scottish Parliament, and it's a partly a PR-based election, and there weren't supposed to be anybody could win an all-out uh, overall majority in, in relation to the elections because of the electoral system. But at the recent SNP conference, Alex Salmon <coughs> tried to make the pitch and give a kind of an indication of the way in which the SNP will run this referendum campaign. I want to quote from it because I think it's instructive and interesting in the way the direction the SNP are, are moving. Salmon made the point, a quote here, only independence offers an escape route for more cuts under Labour and the Tories. We face a Westminster government held bent on pulling our society apart at the seams. Austerity is a one-way street with tax cuts for the rich and benefit cuts for the poorest. Billions to be spent on nuclear weapons while families struggle to heat their homes. What kind of brave new world is this? Now is the time for Scotland to seize a different future. And by that he means independence. Now that type of populist rhetoric, based as it is of course in the idea that under capitalism in Scotland, you wouldn't have all these problems of poverty, inequality, savage cuts and austerity, which of course is nonsense. But that idea of a kind of left pitch of a populist rhetoric can have an impact in the referendum, particularly against the backdrop of the way in which not just the condemned government are conducting themselves as an anti-working class, savage government against their interests, but the Labour Party in Scotland, their response to the rise of the SNP in the last number of years is to shift Labour further to the right. And it opens up an even bigger vacuum in relation to the need 
for the emergence of a new mass workers' party, not just in Scotland, but of course in Britain and a number of countries internationally <coughs> as well. Because the leadership of the Scottish Labour Party, criminally, from, from even from their narrow interests, have now decided to uh, make an assault against the SNP, not from the left, not for making the cuts as they have done, asked to them by the condemned government, but have now decided to shift Labour to the ground of the condemns themselves. They've come out against free tuition fees for students in Scotland, something the SNP introduced in 2000, uh, 2007. They've come out against free prescription charges in relation to the Scottish Parliament. They've demanded an ending to free personal care, care for the elderly. They've demanded an ending to free bus travel for pensioners as well in Scotland. They, they, they want the tearing up of what they call the something for nothing culture, which by the way could have been written by the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, or a speech from any Tory politician over the last 10, 15 or 20 years. In other words, every single relative progressive policy that the um, SNP government have introduced or the Scottish Parliament's introduced is going to be put to the sword by, by New Labour and yesterday of course they announced they intend to keep trying in relation to nuclear weapons on the Clyde which by the way is, is also a major issue for significant sections of the Scottish population as well and that in relation to the position that Labour has taken is an indication of an opening if you like for the SNP and the pro-independence forces in Scotland they will try, 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 try to use. One of the reasons why the SNP have developed as a, a populist force to the left of Labour is because of the, the, the move to the right by the Labour Party itself, but because also the SNP leadership know that if they're going to win a referendum on independence, they're going to have to make sure that they stick to the left flank of the other main capitalist parties in the it itself. And as I made the point earlier, against the backdrop of austerity and of cuts, of an economic system that cannot recover from depression and slump, it's under those conditions that you can see that the possibility of a vote for Scottish independence, if not a majority, in a significant section of the working class moving in that direction. But there is another point that we should make here, and that is that what will be the type of campaign by the pro-union, better together, pro-capitalist forces who want to maintain the union. It will be ferocious. It's already started in relation to the would Scotland if it's independent be allowed into the European Union and the intervention of a number of, of Spanish uh, leading politicians because of the fear of the breakup of the Spanish state have raised this issue that Scotland would not be allowed to join the European Union, uh, union or at least would have to wait in a queue for a lengthy period of time before they could participate. Salmond and the SNP leadership have we tried to redefine independence for Scotland. So under an independent Scotland, under their plans, we would keep the pound, be part of a sterling zone with interest rates set by the Bank of England in relation to Scotland. That in relation to NATO, the SNP conference three weeks ago voted now that the, an independent Scotland would participate in the nuclear alliance of NATO, which split the SNP conference down the middle, actually. But two MSPs have now resigned from the SNP as a result of the vote for, for the SNP, which had a long-standing opposition to NATO, to now join in that, that, that particular organisation. The Queen would remain, remain as the head of state in independent Scotland as well. And the emphasis of the SNP has been to try to redefine independence from the point of view of moving in the, di moving in the direction of trying to appeal to, to um, the section of the working class and middle class people who support more powers but not independence itself. Now there are tactics in relation to the referendum and I'll just finish on these few points uh, before we have, have, have the discussion. We, have, we are in the process of drawing up uh, a list of demands, if you like, a workers charter, a socialist and left <coughs> charter for the referendum. We raised it earlier on in my introduction, the key central slogan of an independent socialist Scotland linked to a socialist confederation within the Wales Island as a step to a socialist Europe. But we have to go further, because one of the key debates that are going to take place now is the question of how the powers of independence or of maximum devolution or enhanced devolution are going to be used and in whose interest will they be used. And that poses a number of questions of the need to have a manifesto of the left, of the trade unions, of the working class, of the socialist left in this referendum that's prepared to put to the forefront the need for nationalisation of public ownership, the need for wealth redistribution, 
They need to end the war on welfare and to fight for a decent minimum wage, a decent living standards for the working class and a massive programme of investment to rebuild public services as well. And it's very important that those types of ideas are put on the agenda and we're involved in discussions with our leading trade union comrades in Britain and PCS and other unions. The way in which we try and develop a campaign around some of the key issues around the powers of the parliament and in whose interests what will they both be used. Because our programme on the national question has got to have a two-fold character. We have to defend and articulate the democratic rights of the Scottish people, but also to participate in a programme that doesn't foster illusions in what an independent capital Scotland could deliver in relation to 2014 and the, and, and the referendum. We have to remorselessly expose the bourgeois and petty bourgeois nationalism of the SNP, of the other pro-capitalist forces as, as well in relation to, to, to this debate. We have to warn of the dangers of an independent capitalist Scotland and to counterpose to that socialism, not just in Scotland but internationally as well. But it's interesting to note in the referendum the way in which the left in Scotland has capitulated to left nationalism already, even two years ahead of the, of the referendum. The forces that, that are now the rump, if you like, of what's left of the Scottish Socialist Party, the split off of the SWP, the International Socialist Group, and other organisations of that kind, have really collapsed into the Yes Scotland <coughs> um, are not raising the class questions, are giving, if you like, the SNP a free run in relation to the referendum campaign itself are able to write things like, for example, independence would mean the people of Scotland own and control the resources of their country. As if it's automatic on the basis of independence that we, the working class, then own and control the means of production. Without nationalisation, without public ownership and democratic workers' control and management, without a socialist plan of production, in what way would the Scottish working class have control over the resources of Scotland if it wasn't linked to a thoroughgoing socialist programme in relation to the economy? Or the idea that an independent Scotland, which is raised by sections of the left now in Scotland, an independent Scotland could take its place alongside the successful small countries of Europe, like Slovakia, like Iceland, like Estonia, like Hungary. These are the examples that we use in relation to the independence debate currently in, in, in relation to, 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 to Scotland. Or they've adopted really a position of two stages. That first of all, we get Scottish independence and then we can pose the question of socialism later on. And it's summed up by this idea uh, <coughs> the British state is a roadblock to progressive policies and that needs to be bulldozed aside. That there is nothing that can be done within the confines of the British state and that independence is the only way to then develop progressive policies for Scotland. And that makes a twofold mistake. First of all, it completely writes off the ability of the working class in England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland to struggle, to deliver a 24-hour general strike, to bring down the condemned government, to build a new mass workers' party and to pose the question of a socialist society. And that's what lies behind this ideology, is the question that the working class is incapable of fighting to defend its class interests not just in, in Britain, but even in Scotland as well. And that's what they pose, in my opinion, in a very clear way. But it also makes another mistake, and that is that it tries to reinforce the illusion that on the basis of Scottish independence you will have a priori, a more progressive Scotland. A Scotland without the neoliberal agenda, a Scotland without savage cuts on austerity, a Scotland with more equal and more socially just, and on the basis of capitalism. The idea that an independent Scotland would offer a route towards equality, social justice, and so on, is an absolute chimera. It's a con. Unfortunately, sections of the left in Scotland are going on with that con in order to try to maximise a vote for, um, for, for independence in, in 2014 itself. From our point of view, it's very disappointing to see the position of the trade union leaders. The trade union leaders in Scotland are going to take a position of abstention, of agnosticism in relation to this discussion. We are already hearing from the STUC, the leaders of Unison of the GMB and other unions, that as far as they are concerned, they do not want to participate in this debate because it is divisive among the working class. 
Now that's, that, there's a strong echo of the position in Northern Ireland where for decades the trade union movement refused to take a position on the national question in Northern Ireland because it was divisive. They weren't prepared to put the class questions to the fore, the only way you can unite the working class is to put forward a class program fighting the cuts, fighting austerity and raising the question of a socialist society. But the trade union leaders, and particularly the STUC, seem now to be moving rapidly in the direction of saying we will not have any comment, we will not comment on these questions, we will not take a, take a, take a position. And that's a major mistake for an organisation that has got 650,000 members in Scotland, where one in three of the Scottish workforce is in a trade union currently. The idea that the forces that delivered such a resounding mass mobilisation on November the 30th in Scotland of hundreds of thousands who came out on strike in relation to the public sector general strike, the idea that that force should not take an independent class position is absolutely ridiculous under these, these conditions. And we have a, a campaign to fight inside the trade unions for the building of a left socialist pro-trade union campaign that puts the working class to the forefront in, in, in relation to, in relation to the, 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 the referendum. Over the next two years, our party and those that we can reach and work with in terms of trade union activists and others on the left. We want to raise the banner high of class independence. We'll fight for a yes vote in the referendum, but it will be a critical yes vote. We'll expose the dangers of capitalist independence in relation <coughs> to what it means and what it would mean for the working class. But to take any other position other than critical support for a yes vote in the referendum would cut us off from big sections of the working class and young people who are looking towards independence as a way out. We will not reinforce their illusions, if they have illusions, that independence in Scotland on its own would resolve the problems. We'll raise the idea of socialism, of an independent socialist Scotland linked to a socialist confederation, England, Wales and Ireland as a step to a socialist Europe. We'll raise the need to build a new mass workers party to challenge the nationalism and the pro-cuts agenda of the SNP and of the other pro-capitalist parties in Scotland itself. We'll fight for the idea that we need a Scotland for the 99%, not for the 1% in relation to this referendum. We'll make sure that the idea of socialism, of fundamental economic and social change, is not buried under the uh, truce, the ceasefire that's been declared by others on the left in Scotland in relation to the SNP leadership. We'll put the question clearly for socialism, for a transformation of society, top and bottom, not just the struggle for socialism in Scotland, but the struggle internationally to change the world.